Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Princeton Review live stream for the AP English Literature exam. My name is Gina Donegan, and today I'm going to lead you through some tips and tricks for how you can score as high as possible on the English Literature test. This is part two in a three part series. So if you're joining me from last week, welcome back. If you're brand new, um, I will bring you up to speed on some of the most important things you need to know about the test. And we'll also get into some new material today. We're really going to focus on the essays and good strategies for getting high scores on all the essays. So first of all, uh, for those of you who might have missed the first session, let me give you some of the basics. Um, there are three possible dates in which you might be taking the literature test. And remember, we're talking about English literature, not English language. That's a different test. Um, the first date when you might be taking it is on Wednesday, May 5th. And if that's you, then you're taking a traditional paper and pencil exam. So you'll have a test booklet, you'll have a bubble sheet, you'll bubble in your answers, and then it'll be scored electronically with graders reading your handwritten essays. But some of you might be taking this test on Tuesday, May 18th. If that's you, then you might be taking a paper and pencil test, but you could also be taking a digital exam, which means you'll have a computer-based test, probably on a school computer, um, but it's even possible that you might be taking the digital exam at home. And the alternative date for some of you is Tuesday, June 1st. So please find out when you're taking the AP English Literature test and also find out whether you're taking the paper exam or the digital exam. In our first session, I went over some really important details, differences between the paper test and the digital test. So if you don't know much about that, you might want to review the first session so you can get up to speed there. But uh, today, we're really going to focus on the three major essays that are found on the literature test. And we're going to talk about specific ways to approach these essays and also look at some examples of people who wrote good essays on these subjects. So first, uh, this will be the first prompt that you're given. It's called the poetry analysis question or poetry analysis prompt. Now, remember, even though the poetry analysis essay comes first, it doesn't mean that you need to do it first. Okay, in fact, it's better to do the essays that seem easier to you first. So if poetry is not it, you don't have to do poetry first. Uh, but eventually you will need to write the poetry essay. The College Board is going to give you either one or two poems. If they give you one poem, it's probably going to be a fairly long one. If they give you two poems, um, chances are those poems will be related in some way. Maybe they'll be by the same author or a similar subject, chances are there are going to be similarities and differences in the two poems, and that's part of what you're going to write about in your essay. Your job with the poetry analysis essay is to do, first of all, a clear thesis. You need to respond to the prompt question with some sort of defensible interpretation, which really means a clear thesis statement. In the first session, I gave you the basics of how to structure your essay, and I would suggest that you always put the thesis in paragraph one. You also need to support your thesis with evidence. So select and use evidence from the poem. This may mean quoting specific lines. It might mean paraphrasing stanzas, whatever you think is appropriate to uh, provide that evidence. And then most importantly, you need to explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning. This is really going to be the bulk of your essay, the evidence and explaining it. And of course, we want to make sure that our essay is well written with appropriate grammar and punctuation and some good vocabulary wouldn't hurt too. So what you'll need to do is not only read the poem that they give you, but you'll also need to read the question that comes before it. And this is really important. You need to make sure that you're answering the question that's actually asked. So when you read the poem, always ask yourself, what is the meaning of the poem? And how do I know that that's the meaning? Because whatever indicates the meaning to you is the, the kind of thing that you should be writing about in your essay. 
So let's take a look at an example of the kind of poetry that you might see attached to the poetry analysis essay prompt. First of all, if you're given any kind of introduction, always read it. Don't skip the introduction because the introduction will tell you perhaps who the poet is. It might even give you a good summary of what the poems are about. And then it's actually going to ask you a question. So this is a really important thing to read. Here, our introduction says, in the following poems by William Blake, the speaker, most likely a small child known as a chimney sweep, has been forced to work inside chimneys cleaning the interiors. Read the poems carefully. Then in a well-written essay, compare and contrast the two poems and the ways that Blake uses poetic elements and techniques to express, here it is, the plight of the chimney sweep. So we need to answer that specific question, right? We have to be focused on the chimney sweep, who we know is a child. We have to figure out what the plight of the chimney sweep is. And we have to somehow use both poems comparing and contrasting them. So there's going to be a little of both, right? Similarities, but also differences. And the more we can point to specifics, the better. Now, right off the bat, we know the poet is William Blake. If you've never heard of the poet before, don't panic. They don't expect you to have any outside knowledge about the poet. Um, but if you know William Blake, you know that he wrote poetry in the late 1700s or even early 1800s. So, you know, he's a fairly old poet. Um, and we know that some of the themes back then were often about big topics like love and death and um, spiritual matters. But this one seems more specific, a small child working as a chimney sweep. Now, even if you don't know the poet, a lot of times you can infer the time period by little things like a child cleaning a chimney, right? We don't have children that work as chimney sweeps anymore. So we can figure that this is an older poem before our time. So let's take a look at the first poem. Most poems have a title, right? This one is called, very simply, The Chimney Sweeper, poem one. So let's read it and let's see if we can just get a general sense of what it's about, but maybe we'll notice some other things like something about the rhyme scheme or something about symbolism. If we pick up any other things, we can mark those as we go along. And I think a really important thing to start with in a poem is who is the speaker? Because sometimes the speaker is the poet, but sometimes he's not. So you want to try to figure out who the speaker is. When my mother died, I was very young. And my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep and in soot I sleep. We definitely see some rhyme there, right? Now, there's a little note ended to the end of this poem. It says, the child's lisping attempt at the chimney sweep street cry, sweep, sweep. Okay, so here it's very clear that the narrator of this poem is a young child who is a chimney sweep. And we see things like, um, you know, my mother died, my father sold me. So we know this child has had a sad childhood. There's little Tom Dacre who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So I said, hush, Tom, never mind it. For when your head's bare, you know that the soot cannot spoil your white hair. Okay, so now we have a new character. It's always good to notice characters in any work of fiction or poetry. And we have a simile, his head that curled like a lamb's back. Now, at some point, we might want to try to figure out why he refers to his head as like a lamb's back. That might be important. If nothing comes to you when you're reading the poem, that's fine. And so he was quiet, and that very night, as Tom was asleeping, he had such a sight that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, Ned, and Jack, were all of them locked up in, in coffins of black. Now, the question is, should we be taking this literally? Should we believe that the children or the chimney sweepers are all dead? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but notice it says, as Tom was asleeping, he had such a sight. So that tells us this is more likely to be a dream, right? It's probably not something that really happened. 
And by came an angel who had a bright key, and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain, leaping, laughing, they run and wash in a river and shine in the sun. So what do we have here? Well, Tom is still having the dream and he's dreaming of something very joyful, right? And it's a sharp contrast to the life of a chimney sweep, right? Because they're leaping, they're laughing, they're washed, right? If you're a chimney sweep, you're probably dirty all the time. So here they're washed in the river and shine in the sun. So this is a nice dream. Then naked and white, all their bags left behind, they rise upon clouds and sport in the wind. And the angel told Tom, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. So what do we have here? Well, they're white, which is a contrast to being a chimney sweep. All their bags left behind. Now that could be literal as in the work bags that they use in their everyday lives. But it could also be their burdens, right? Their emotional sadness. That might be the bags that they're leaving behind. And again, we get the sense that they're joyful. What's also interesting here in line 20 is that we have a reference to God. Now, what's interesting about this is in the dream, the children are actually dead, right? And they're going to heaven. But this is being presented as a better fate than being a chimney sweep, right? Because they're joyful and they would have God for a father. Remember, the first stanza told us that this child's mother and father are out of the picture. And then our last stanza. And so Tom awoke and we rose in the dark and got with our bags and our brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. Now that last line might be a reference to having God for a father and never wanting for joy, right? The idea that if you have God for a father and you do your duty, you won't fear harm. Okay, so it's a poem with a fairly clear meaning. We can see that the tone is overall fairly sad because we know that the dream is not real, right? This child lives a much worse life than the dream would indicate. Okay, now let's contrast that with the second poem, which is also called The Chimney Sweeper. Um, and let's see if we can spot any similarities or differences and see if we can spot the narrator. A little black thing among the snow crying weep, weep in notes of woe. Where are they father? Where are they father and mother say? They are both gone up to the church to pray. So what do we see so far? We see a little black thing that's probably a child, right? Because the child is crying, weep, weep. And we saw that line in the other poem. In notes of woe, so this child is sad. And again, we have a child who's lacking a mother and a father. Why is he lacking a mother and a father? Well, it says they're both gone up to the church to pray. Should we take that literally? Um, I don't know. Maybe they're gone up to the church to pray, but it may be something... Uh, worse, like uh, they're dead or something. But we know this child is sad. Because I was happy upon the heath and smiled among the winter snow, they clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. They clothed me in the clothes of death. Well, remember, this is called the chimney sweeper. He's a little black thing among the snow because he's been sweeping chimneys. He's crying in notes of woe. And apparently, according to paragraph two or stanza two, the parents are somehow responsible for clothing him in clothes of death and teaching him to sing notes of woe. And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think they have done me no injury and are gone to praise God and his priest and king who make up a heaven of our misery. So this poem is a little bit harder to figure out. It's not quite as obvious as the first one. What's a little unclear is where the parents are, right? Are the parents actually at the church or is it possible that the parents are dead? Because that might, going up to the church to pray might be a kind of metaphor for going to heaven. And it makes this reference to heaven at the end. Line 10, they think they have done me no injury. So these parents think that they haven't harmed the child. And then I think the most powerful line is the last line, a heaven of our misery. So 
if we contrast this poem with the last poem, this one is probably a little more overtly negative about religion or God, right? Because um, it's kind of like, well, they're ignoring me in favor of God and, you know, God has a heaven of misery. Um, so I think you could read this poem on two different levels. It may be about the parents, but you could also make the case that it's about uh, something broader, like Christian people in general, or people who only think about church and not about children or something to that effect. So once you read through both of the poems, then you want to ask yourself, okay, what are the major points that I'm going to make? So we know the meanings of the poems. That's kind of the first step. And if you don't think you understand the meaning of the poem, go back and read it, right? Make sure you've got the literal meaning. When you're brainstorming ideas for your essay, ask yourself some things. First of all, what is suggested by the title? Now, in this case, there's nothing special about the title. It just says the chimney sweeper. But what's interesting is both of the poems have the same title. So it may be that the author is trying to say two slightly different things with those two different poems. Who is the speaker? We've kind of got that, right? We know the speaker of the first poem is an actual child chimney sweep. And in the second poem, it appears to also be a child chimney sweep. Who is the audience? Well, that seems to be just a general audience, right? No one special, but just the reader. What is the dramatic situation that prompted the speaker to speak? Now, this is where if you have any outside knowledge about the subject, it might help you a little bit. If you know something about children who used to be chimney sweeps in um, you know, Victorian or even earlier times, then you could discuss that. But if you really know nothing about children that were used as chimney sweeps, you could just assume it's in the past and that's the dramatic situation. And so then that sort of prompts the question, well, why would Blake be writing about this? Um, and I think it's fair to say that he's probably trying to draw awareness to the plight of children who have to work in dangerous jobs. So it's a poem or two poems with a bit of a social agenda. What problem is being explored? We know that. And does the poem have a solution? I don't think so. God and religion is not really being presented as a solution. If anything, it's presented as maybe uh, a stumbling block. What feelings do we get from the poem? Well, hopefully you felt kind of sad, sympathetic, right? And then the overall effect is obviously to perhaps draw out sympathy, make you think about the issue. And if he was writing to people in his time, which of course he was, he was probably hoping that it would draw awareness to a social problem. By the way, if you have any comments or questions as we go along, I would welcome you to just type those comments or questions into the chat field. Um, we have a small group today, so we should be able to talk about anything you want. So now that we've gotten some ideas there, I'd like to show you a poem that was written on this actual prompt. And what we're gonna do is take a look at what the author does well. Maybe there are some things the author could have done better, but we're mostly gonna see if the author fulfills the requirements to get a six. Remember, to get a six, you need a clear thesis, you need to support it with lots of evidence, and ideally you might have some kind of sophistication to your writing style. That's really what it takes to get a six. So let's look at the first paragraph. The Chimney Sweeper is a pair of poems written in the late 18th century about the plight of young children forced to work as chimney sweeps. So this is just giving us background information. Now, the fact that the author seems to understand who the poet the poet Blake is, is definitely a positive. Although the narrators in each seem to have profoundly different perspectives, the stylistic unity and similarities in figurative language indicate that William Blake blames social and religious authorities for the fate of the chimney sweeps in both. So here we have a clear thesis. The author is saying something about the poems. That's important, okay? A good thesis statement is not just, well, there are similarities and differences with the poems and I'm going to talk about them. That's not a thesis statement. You do have to put forth your own unique idea or distinctive idea about what you think um, the poet is actually 
talking about what is the poet's purpose. And in this case, we do have a clear purpose, which is blaming social and religious authorities for the fate of the child chimney sweeps. So far, we have fairly good writing style. Let's take a look at the body paragraphs. So in each one of the body paragraphs, we need to do two things. We need to present evidence, but the most important thing is we need to explain it. The biggest trap that people fall into with this kind of essay is to just summarize the poems. That's the wrong approach. If you're only summarizing, you will not score the maximum for this part of the scoring, which is a maximum of four points. If you're only summarizing, you might only score one or two points, which means you're stuck in the average range. To get a high score, you do need to tell the grader what's in the essay, but you also need to explain how it supports your thesis. So let's look at paragraph two, which is the first body paragraph. Both narrators are chimney sweeps, but the tone of each contrasts sharply with the other. Now, what I'm noticing up front is some mention of some really key terms that I told you about in our first live stream. So far, we have narration and tone, two really important things to mention wherever possible. The first speaker has been cruelly treated as he was sold into work when he was very young. So that's a little quote from the poem. Notice it's a short quote. He nonetheless attempts to offer comfort to a fellow chimney sweep, Tom Dacre, who is upset when his hair is shaved. The speaker tells of a dream Tom has in which an angel tells him he'd have God for his father and never want joy. Now, so far, this is mostly just telling us what the poem is about. Hopefully, we're going to get some explanation here. The narrator implies at the end that not only can Tom be comforted by a vision of heaven with God and the angel, but all the hardworking sweeps can be as well, because if they all do their duty, they need not fear harm. Okay, so this paragraph is primarily description. That's okay, as long as we get some good explanation that comes after it at some point. The second speaker's tone is far more overtly unhappy. He doesn't see God as a beneficent parent, so that's good vocabulary, but condemns God and his priest and king for causing the sweep's plight. They make up a heaven of our misery. His parents who have gone up to the church to pray are responsible as well. So notice this author does a good job of using quotes and doesn't actually say where the parents have gone because that may not be entirely clear. Um, we don't know if these parents are actually dead or alive, but just saying they have gone up to the church to pray communicates the idea that the parents have neglected the child. And so again, so far we're getting mostly description. So let's check out the third body paragraph. On the surface then, the narrator in each poem expresses quite different beliefs. One is optimistic and one is quite bitter. So what I see here is contrast, which is what they were asking us for. Yet the poems are not completely different. They are unified by multiple stylistic elements. So we have comparison because the direction said contrast and comparison. The first of course is the identical title. The unity continues into the first stanza with both using the weep weep cry the sweeps employed to announce their services. In each weep reminds the readers of the cry of a child and thus appeals to their sympathy about the injustice done to the sweeps. Through this unity, Blake shows readers that despite the stark contrast in each narrator's point of view, the poems are in fact a unit, not two widely divergent works of art. The imagery of the two poems echo each other as well with use of contrasting white and black. The sweeps are inked with soot and black coffins in poem one in vivid contrast to being naked and white later on in Tom's dream. The initial figure in poem two, line one, mirrors this, contrasting black and white as the sweep is a little black thing among the snow. So this author does a great job with evidence. And if you're prov providing lots of evidence, you will do a good job of scoring some of those middle points, the one through four points that make up the bulk of your score. Now let's see if the author goes a little deeper. An analysis of these unified images leads readers to question the first narrator's optimism. 
The chimney sweeps in poem one are after all locked up in coffins of black as in Tom's dream. Coffins and chimneys are similar, dark rectangles into which the boys' bodies are placed. So that's really interesting. We've got some great symbolism there. The coffin is thus a metaphor for the chimneys. While the freedom given by the angel who had a bright key to the coffins is associated with heaven, the boys rise upon clouds and go to a place where God is the father, it is also linked to death because of the coffins. The association with dying is repeated and made explicit in poem two, where the narrator is clothed in the clothes of death by his parents. So the author is definitely doing a good job of proving the thesis, because remember, the thesis was about a critique of social and religious authorities. So far, the author hasn't really spelled it out for us directly, but it's definitely being given to us in a very indirect manner. And let's take a look at the next paragraph. Once readers notice this imagery, they realize that Blake intends the first poem's conclusion to be ironic. Regardless of the speaker's attempt to reassure a fellow chimney sweep and possibly himself that things will be all right, it's ultimately death the boys in poem one are sold into. The boys in each poem meet a miserable fate. But Blake does not intend the ending of poem two to be ironic. The speaker indicts religion the state, king, and parents in the system that condemns him to a bleak life. The end is abrupt, our misery, as Blake intends readers to sympathize with that view. Religion and duty are a false comfort in the first poem. In the second, religion and parents help null the figurative, sorry, nail the figurative coffin shut. So we're getting closer to that thesis, right? At first, we thought it was going to be a lot of description. Now we're pretty deeply into the thesis. So that's an example of a fairly good essay. Now, if I was going to try to make that essay a little better, here's what I would suggest. First of all, the essay really should have been only about five paragraphs. I think there were more paragraphs there than needed to be. Also, I think the author probably should have done a more direct job of addressing the thesis more directly. It was in there, don't get me wrong, it was definitely in there, but I think a little more obvious explanation could have been more effective. And it also felt like the conclusion wasn't perhaps as strong as it could be. But this is definitely a strong essay. It would get a minimum of a score of four. I think it would actually get a five. And if the author did just a little bit more direct interpretation of how the evidence relates to the thesis, it could have gotten a six. So it's a very good essay, but um, it gives you an idea. The best thing about that essay is it gives you an idea of how to present evidence. Notice the author's using a lot of quotes, but the quotes aren't terribly long, right? They're fairly short quotes, but there's lots and lots of evidence. So in case you just joined us, um, you are welcome to ask any questions that you might have. All you have to do is type your question into the chat field and uh, there's a helpful moderator here named Shadna who will pass the question on to me. So if you do have any, don't be shy. Um, otherwise, we'll just move on to our next type of essay. So now we're going to talk about the prose fiction analysis essay. So here you're going to be given a fairly long work of prose fiction. It's approximately five to 700 words, which means it's going to take a while to read it. Um, and your job is to respond to that prose fiction in sort of a similar way to how you respond to the poem. In other words, you need to answer the question that they ask and provide a lot of evidence to prove your answer. So that means you always need a thesis, which the College Board calls a defensible interpretation. You need to use evidence to support your thesis a bare minimum of about three to five pieces of evidence. Let's say a minimum of three, but probably four or five is better. Explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning, very crucial. And then of course, watch your writing style, make sure that you're writing in um, a sound manner with decent grammar and punctuation and hopefully some good vocabulary. So just like the poem, when you read the prose fiction piece, ask yourself, what is the meaning of this and how do I know it? Because however you know it, 
you know, that's the, the kind of thing that you should be incorporating in your essay. So as we did with the poem, um, you want to read any introductions associated with the work because it's going to give you a good jump on what it's about. This one says the following excerpt is from Ultramarine by Malcolm Lowry, published in 1933. Read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how Lowry uses literary elements and techniques such as imagery and interior monologue to paint a picture of Dana Hilliot, a young lad from a well-off family as he ventures to sea as a sailor. So they're using some of the same wording in this question, right? Literary elements and techniques. That's basically what we saw in the poem uh, directions. They put out things like imagery and interior monologue, but keep in mind, those are not the only things that you might find in this, right? Those are just examples. But I like how they've given us examples because those are the things we can look at or look for right away. And what the prompt really wants you to do is give a kind of character sketch. So they're really asking, okay, who is Dana Hilliot? What do we know about him? And how do we know these things from the author's use of literary devices? So as we read, we're going to want to pay attention to who this character is, but also see if we can spot any specifics, especially the imagery and the interior monologue. So let's read through this one. Um, Puella Mea, okay, a foreign language reference. But fortunately, we do have a little footnote here. The footnote says, my girl. So we know he's writing to a girl. And before I read this, let me just see if we have any questions from the chat. So um, is there a specific format for the essay? Yes. As a matter of fact, if you missed the first live stream, you might want to go back and review that because we talked exactly about how you should structure all of your essays. But basically what I recommend is a five paragraph essay format. First paragraph would be an introduction. Last paragraph would be a conclusion. And the three paragraphs in the middle would be body paragraphs. I think that's the best way to go. Technically, you don't need to follow that format in order to get a high score. But I just think that for most people, that's a format that's going to help you to get a high score because it's going to, first of all, force you to be well organized. It also means you're probably going to write a longer essay if you if you strive for five paragraphs instead of, say, three or four. Um, so I think it's the format that works for most students. But technically, it's not required in the scoring rubric. OK, so if we look at this prose fiction piece, it starts with Puella Mea, which we know is my girl or my love. No, not you, not even my supervisor would recognize me as I sit here upon the number six hatch drinking ships coffee. OK, so we already know from the introduction that he's a sailor. He's out at sea. And now we have this image of the ship. Driven out and compelled to be chased. The whole deep blue day is before me. The breakfast dishes must be washed up. The forecastle and the latrines must be cleaned and scrubbed. The alleyway too, for this is what sea life is like now. So he's just giving her an idea of his everyday life. We don't necessarily have to read this whole thing, but let's just read enough to figure out kind of what it's about. Um, and then he starts talking about the sea in general. So the sea, what it may suggest to you. Perhaps you think of a deep gray sailing ship lying over in the seas. So these are the things people would think of when they think of the sea. But then he says, well, those were the ancient violences, the old heroic days of holy stones. And they have gone, you say. But the sea is nonetheless the sea. Man scatters even farther and farther the footsteps of exile. So now he's gotten into this sort of discussion of what it's like to be at sea. Um, and then he goes into the specific work that he's doing, right? Shorten the sail, rig derricks, paint the smokestack. Um, and he gets into a lot more detail. Uh, notice this whole thing is just one giant paragraph. So I think it's supposed to be one letter that he's writing to his girlfriend or wife. Um, then it gives more detail about what it feels like to be on the sea, a drowsy calm, um, things that happen in the night, uh, lots of specific details. 
Um, and so he goes on and on about specific details of being on the ship. And then if we just look toward the end, it says, then all at once the pace slackens, the avalanche of hewing becomes a firm measured beat of an even deliberate force. The arm swings like a rocking machine and our fist loosens its grip on the slim haft. And so I sit chipping, dreaming of you, Janet, until the iron facing shows or until eight bells go or until the bosun comes and knocks us off. Oh, Janet, I do love you so, but let us have no nonsense about it. Okay, so we get the gist of it, right? He's talking about his life at sea in very strong um, imagistic terms, right? Lots of imagery. Um, I see a lot of alliteration in here too. Um, so those are all things that we could talk about in an essay. And the tone of this is sort of, well, he's accepting his fate of being out at sea, but we can tell that he misses his life on land. So let's take a look at the essay that was written about this one. And again, we'll see if we can spot a clear thesis. We'll see if we can find good evidence. And we want to make sure the author is explaining that evidence in order to support the thesis. So here's the introduction. In the passage, Malcolm Lowry effectively uses the resources of language to create an, an interior monologue, a mental speech, to dramatize the adventures a young English boy has aboard a ship and show the character of the boy, Dana Hilliot, as well. So what has the author done in that first sentence? Well, kind of summarize the prose fiction piece, right? We know this is about the adventures of a young English boy aboard a ship, but also has addressed some of the things that were in the directions, like interior monologue. That was one of the things they mentioned, and also showing the character of the boy, which is what they specifically asked you to do. So. You want to show the reader that you clearly understand what the directions were asking you to do. He uses vivid imagery, which was another thing that they mentioned, and many details from the boy's life to show who Hilliot is and what he thinks and captures the different rhythms of life aboard a ship. Now, my only criticism of this paragraph is it doesn't necessarily have a strong thesis, okay? We know that the author is going to discuss the character of the boy, but we don't have a lot of specifics about what that is yet. Now, we might get those specifics later on, which is a good thing, but I think what would have made this paragraph stronger is a slightly stronger, more obvious thesis statement. Um, yes, somebody asked about the multiple choice section. There definitely is a multiple choice section. We're actually going to focus on that tomorrow night. So if you want to rejoin me tomorrow night at seven, we're going to focus in on the multiple choice. Uh, by the way, in that first session, um, we talked about the entire structure of the test. Okay, so let's look at our body paragraphs. First, Hilliot thinks that no one, not even my superior, would recognize me. This shows that Hilliot thinks he has changed and that life at sea has changed him. So right there, we have the two things you need to get the highest score possible. We have evidence, which is the quote, but then we have the explanation behind that. This shows something about Hilliot, which is what they want you to do here is do a character sketch. But he's happy. He likes the change, as he says, and then there's another quote. But there are many conflicting feelings in Hilliot, and then we have proof for that. He doesn't know whether he thinks life at sea is great or a stinking hell. <laughs> Lowry shows this by switching all the time between images. So notice what the author's doing, right? Touching on imagery, all the specific things that were asked about in the prompt, and hopefully we'll get a little more than that as well. So we can kind of tell what paragraph two is about. And here's our last paragraph already. Through it all, though, Hilliot thinks of Janet. He begins thinking of her Puella Mea, which is Latin for my girl, and ends saying, oh, Janet, I do love you so. This tells us a great deal about Hilliot. He misses his girlfriend and is probably homesick for England, too. These are normal reactions for the character of a young Englishman far from home. And by framing the story between these statements, Lowry shows that the character of Dana Hilliot hasn't changed as much as he thinks it has. Hilliot is still a lo lonely young man with a great deal to learn. Now, one thing you might notice is this essay is pretty short compared to the first one I showed you, right? I think it's maybe a little bit too short. 
And that's one of the reasons I suggest a five paragraph essay is it kind of forces you to write a little bit more. It also keeps your ideas a little bit better organized because right now all we have is one big body paragraph, which is paragraph two, that just mentions a bunch of different things in it. So the organization of this essay could have been a little better. It could have been a little bit longer. And I think this person might miss out on the sophistication point. And the reason I say that is because there wasn't um, a sophisticated thesis, right? It was basically just saying, okay, in the passage, the author shows us some things about Dana Hilliot, but it doesn't really give us many specifics in paragraph one. So therefore, you know, it's a little harder to see beyond just, well, we know some things about the character. So I think it's likely that this person got around a four. It's not a bad essay, um, but it's probably not as good as the first one. The first one's more likely to be a five. Um, and this person really just should have written more and included more evidence and had a stronger thesis. Um, but as you can see, all of our authors have some real positives. They all do a good job of quoting direct evidence from the text. The quotes are not too long. Um, and they do a great job of uh, finding a lot of evidence. So uh, a lot of you are probably, you know, scoring it around a four, but you're really close to getting a six, right? And so as you can see, there are just a few little things that are missing in essays that don't get a six. And obviously I'd like you to get a six. So that's why we're going over this. So again, just let me know if you have any questions about um, any of this, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a much better essay that was written on this subject matter. And we won't necessarily read the whole thing, but I'll show you some of the reasons why this person does get a six. One reason why this person gets a six is because the introduction is really interesting and grabs your attention. Who hasn't dreamed of throwing everything away and running off to sea? And yet very few, few people actually do run off to sea. So that's kind of a cool way to introduce what this prose fiction piece is really about. Now, I think it would have been better if the author had combined the first two paragraphs into one paragraph. Um, but, you know, that's just my opinion. The first paragraph is setting the scene, getting you interested in the topic. The second paragraph is hopefully going to give us a thesis. Um, so it looks like we do have a better thesis here, which is we get something else as well, a detailed portrait of a young, confused man, Dana Hilliot, and all the swirling emotions that he carries in his young heart. Hilliot is lonely, defiant, excited, bored, romantic, and cynical. So notice how that is a whole lot more detailed than what we got in the first essay, right? Here we know what is true of the character. The character is young and confused, but he has some other emotions. It's much more detailed. So that's one the reason why this person would get a six is because the thesis is stronger. And when the thesis is stronger, it makes it easier to prove your thesis. And then looking at the body paragraphs, again, we have the direct quotes. Um, so for instance, um, Puella Maya, but then also some summary. So Dana talks about how unrecognizable he's become. Maybe he really is unrecognizable to his old friends, but it's more likely that he can't recognize himself. So that's a really interesting insight, right? That wasn't spelled out exactly in the text, but this author has made that inference and it seems like a reasonable statement. So remember, the more you can go deeper than what's actually written, the more likely you are to get that sophistication point. And then we have uh, some more, lots of details from the text, but this person does incorporate some quotes too. So notice it's a mixture of paraphrasing and quotes. That's usually the magic uh, formula for these essays is doing a little bit of both. We also have some really good writing style here. Like, Lowry gives us a picture of the wild, terrifying, intense life that Dana thought he was going to lead. Some really good adjectives there. 
Um, the next paragraph says the passage then takes us even deeper into Dana's character and then gives us even more evidence. Notice this essay is a lot longer than the first one we read. And let's look at the conclusion just to see how the author finishes it off. In the end, Dana's loneliness, cut off from his familiar life, returns him to being a moody Romeo dreaming of his girlfriend, imagining sweet talking her. It wells up in him with the line, oh, Janet, I do love you so. But then comes the very last line of the passage, another abrupt change. But let's have no nonsense about it. He's still a young person pouring out his love to his girlfriend, but then a second later, he's pretending to be a tough guy, a sailor who wants no nonsense. By putting these lines one after the other, Lowry shows Dana in the midst of growing up and pretending to be more hardened than he is. So I like this last paragraph because what we get from this is that the character of Dana is a complex character. Maybe there's not just one thing you can say about him. Maybe he's just extremely complex, but I think the author has done a good job of proving that he's a complex character. And it also serves as a conclusion um, in addition to giving us a little bit more information. <clears throat> now, I think the way this person structured the essay was to use kind of a uh, sequential approach. Like it feels like the person kind of started with the beginning of the text and worked his way to the end. That's perfectly fine. You can do it that way if you want to, but you don't have to, right? You can organize the information any way that makes sense to you. But I kind of like the sequential approach working from beginning to middle to end because it's a way to make sure that you're covering all the most important points. Now, remember, you have roughly 40 minutes for each one of these essays. It's up to you how you budget the time. You don't have to use exactly 40 minutes, but most people do tend to budget them out that way. And um, so that means you're just going to want to keep an eye on the clock, right, and make sure you're not wasting too much time on any one essay. Um, so let me just give you some closing suggestions. In tomorrow's live stream, we're definitely going to talk about uh, the literary analysis prompt, and we're going to talk about multiple choice questions. But for now, let's just say that your essays are not just about summary, right? They have to be about a thesis and proving that thesis with evidence. If in doubt, always go for things like imagery, or oppositions. An opposition is just a contrast between things. That's often a really interesting thing to write about. Um, whenever possible, try to be a good writer, right? You you're, don't have to write in an overly flowery or overly pretentious style. But if you see an opportunity to use some flair, that's always a good thing. And always establish what you're going to talk about at the beginning. Um, I would suggest five paragraphs overall, but you may be establishing some of the foundation of your essay in the first two or three paragraphs. We saw that in the poetry essay, right? It took a while to get to the analysis, but we definitely got some in the end. Ideally, your essay should be free of errors, particularly the first paragraph, but of course it's understandable that nobody writes a completely error-free paper. Just try to be aware of your timing and leave a little time to proofread at the end. So um, that's about it for tonight's live stream. As I said, in tomorrow's live stream, we're going to focus on that literary analysis essay and also some multiple choice questions. Tomorrow's live stream will be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And in the meanwhile, check us out at princetonreview.com and check out are cracking the AP English literature book at any bookstore near you. So thank you for your participation tonight. Have a good night and hopefully I'll see you tomorrow.